morning. Man, I want to welcome you to the Sunday after Easter. A lot, little few more parking spaces available, seating spaces available. But thank you for being with us today. I want to ask you a question. Do you ever wonder why about some things? My wife is a why person. She wants to know why. For example, uh, why is it that anyone driving faster than me on I-10 is a maniac, and anybody driving slower than me is an idiot? Can anybody tell me why that is? Well, I gotta, why doesn't glue stick to bottles? Can anybody answer that question for me? Or why is it that we keep opening the refrigerator, expecting to find something new we didn't see the last? Does anybody besides me ever do that? You know what I'm talking about, right? Or why do we press harder on the remote control when the batteries get weak? Do we sometimes think, somehow think we can rejuvenate the batteries by just pressing harder on the remote control? Or why do they lock gas station restrooms? Anybody know why? Maybe they're afraid someone, someone will come in and clean them. I don't know why that is. But I'm telling you, there are a lot of questions we don't have the answers for. And when it comes to life and our purpose in life and what life is all about and what really matters in life, a lot of people don't have any answers to those questions, but Jesus wants you to understand your purpose in life, and he wants you to know how to make a difference for good and for God in the world around us. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. That's what we're in a series how to make life count, as you've already heard. In Proverbs 9, 6, the Bible says that God wants us to live a life of meaning. Say that phrase with me, a life of a life of significance, a life of meaning, a life of impact. And we're learning how to do that uh, in this series that we began last Sunday on Easter Sunday. Now, to live a purposeful, meaningful life, we got to be willing to live differently than many people throughout the world. So take your Bible, a Bible app, and turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2 is our text for today. In his letter to the Philippians, Paul is writing to Christians in the first century city of Philippi. Paul had actually started this church uh, years before uh, with a woman named Lydia. They started with a Bible study, started with a church. It was in Philippi where Paul was arrested for preaching the gospel and helping a demonized woman get delivered from her demonic bondages in her life. You may remember that story. In Acts 16, Paul and Silas were put into prison, but God sent an earthquake to set them free from the prison, and in the process, they led their jailer and his family to faith in Christ. That's so how that church began, in a miraculous kind of way. Paul and Silas were there for three months. And years later, Paul's writing back to those Christians in the city of Philippi, and he's teaching them how to experience joy. If I say joy, how to have joy in spite of their circumstances, and he's telling them how to live a life with meaning. Here's what we find in Philippians chapter 2, beginning with verse 12. Dear friends, Paul says, you always followed my instructions when I was with you. And now that I'm away, it is even more important. Work hard. If I say work hard, work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Do everything, everything, everything without complaining and griping and moaning and arguing so that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. Hold firmly to the word of life, that on the day of Christ's return, I will be proud that I did not run the race in vain and that my work was not useless, but I will rejoice even if I lose my life, pouring it out like a liquid offering to you, just like your faithful service is an offering to God. And I want all of you to share that joy. Tell the person beside you, I want you to have that joy. Go ahead and tell them that. I want all of you to share that joy. Yes, you should rejoice. And Paul says, I will share your joy. The Lord, speak to us today by your word, by your spirit, through this pastor, in ways that will encourage us, in ways that will challenge us, in ways that will convict us, and ultimately in ways that will change us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. In the passage we read, Paul is calling those first century Christians, as well as those of us who are 21st century Christians, to, to live a different kind of life than the rest of the people in the world. Now, I'm not talking about living a weird life. Tell the person beside you, you don't have to be weird. Go and tell them that. I'm not talking about a weird life, but I'm talking about a different kind of life, a transformed kind of life. So here's today's question. What does it take to live a godly, different kind of life? Three primary things I want you to 
write down today on your sermon guide. First of all, to live a different kind of life, we must work on our salvation. We've got to work on our salvation. In the opening verse of our passage, Paul writes, work hard to show the results of your salvation. Now, that phrase, that phrase, work hard, is already a contention for many people because a lot of people don't want to work hard. How many of you have ever met anybody who's lazy? Don't look to the left or right. Just look at me right now. Anybody who's lazy. Someone said, someone said we shouldn't look down on lazy people. They haven't done anything. <laughs> Where I come from, people ask one another, have you been working hard or hardly working? And lots of people have to admit they're hardly working. Now, some people don't work hard on their jobs, in their careers, or around the house. Others don't work hard on their marriage. They don't want to work hard on their relationships with their children. And still others are not working hard at deepening their relationship with the Lord, developing to a greater extent their salvation relationship with the Lord. Let me explain some things. We experience God's salvation as we recognize our need for the Lord, as we're willing to repent of our sins, turn from our way to God's way, as we put our faith and trust in Jesus, as we surrender our lives, that's how we experience God's salvation. Let me ask you, when did that happen for you? It happened for me in a dorm room on, uh, on a Saturday morning in Tallahassee, Florida. I'd been out getting loaded the night before, but on that Saturday morning, I realized there was a void and vacuum in my life that no thing, no person, no pleasure, nothing could fill that void and vacuum in my life. I asked Jesus Christ to come into my life and change my life, and guess what? He answered that prayer on that day. And I knew I was different. When I got up, I would flush my drugs down the toilet, pour my alcohol down the drain, threw my pornography magazine away, got rid of both my girlfriends, and started living for the Lord. I had been transformed by Jesus Christ. Well, when did that happen for you? Where did that happen for you? It may have been in a church service like we're in today. It may have been in your bedroom. It may have been, it may have been at somebody else's house. It may have been in a coffee shop if someone shared with you. But, but when and where did you begin a relationship with Jesus Christ? Now, when Paul said work hard on your salvation, he wasn't saying that we have to work for our salvation. In fact, there is no way we could have earned our salvation by our good works, our moral lives, or our religiosity or our church attendance. You know, some people think they're going to make it to heaven just because they lived a more moral life than their neighbor or the person beside you. But I heard an old preacher say one time, living a moral life may keep you out of jail, but it won't keep you out of hell. A lot of people think they're going to make it to heaven simply because they attend church services. But I heard another old preacher say one time, being, being, a, being in a church doesn't make you a Christian any more than being in a garage makes you a car. You see, our good works, our morality, our religiosity, all those kinds of things, uh, they're good to have in our life, but they don't bring salvation to our life. None of us have ever been good enough, done enough good to earn our salvation. The Bible says none of us are righteous enough to earn salvation. We experience salvation not because of how we lived or what we've done, but because of God's grace in response to our faith in Jesus Christ. Paul wrote, God saved you by his grace. When you believe. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us, tell the person beside you, not even you, none of us can boast about it. So what does Paul mean in Philippians 2.12 when he says work hard in your salvation? He was saying that we don't, we don't work for our salvation, but we're to work hard on getting the most of our, out of our salvation. In Paul's days, uh, the words work hard on were used for working a mind getting out of the mine, all the valuables that were in the mine. It was referred to a, a field, getting the greatest possible harvest out of the field. And what Paul is saying is that we're to work hard on our salvation so we get as much out of the Christian life as we possibly can. So what helps us to do that? Well, first of all, we work on our salvation. We focus on getting closer to the Lord. On Palm Sunday, we were in John chapter 15 here at Celebration Church. Remember these words. Jesus said, remain in me, and I'll remain in you. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me, unless you stay close to me. Jesus' words tell us the more we focus on getting close to him, the more we focus on deepening our relationship with him, the more fruitful and more productive we become in our life, the more we get out of our salvation. So what are some ways, some steps we can take to stay close to the Lord? Well, praying. Everybody say praying. Praying every day is a way to stay close to the Lord. Reading God's Word is a way to stay close to the Lord. Worshiping the Lord regularly with other believers is a way to stay close to the Lord. Fellowshipping with other Christians is a way to stay close to the Lord. Those are disciplines that, that when constantly practiced in our life, help us to draw closer to the Lord, get stronger in our faith, and develop the salvation we have in our lives. 
Now, I, I've been watching a lot of basketball. I love collegiate basketball and collegiate football. I've been watching the, the championship series for both the women and the men. The, uh, the, the leading scorer uh, for all time uh, is playing right now. Her name is Caitlin Clark. She plays for the University of Iowa. And there's been talk of Pistol Pete Maravich recently. He says Caitlin Clark uh, passed his all-time points record, but certainly not his points per game scoring average. Maravich, who played for LSU, was the greatest scorer in college basketball history. He averaged 44.2 points a game throughout his college career, and no one has come within 15 points per game of his lifetime collegiate scoring average. When asked the reason for his excellence, uh, Maravich explained that it was largely in part to his practice and discipline. He said, when I was eight, nine years old, I would dribble the ball two and a half miles into town and dribble the ball two and a half miles walking back from town. When I was a little, got, a, got a little older, I dribbled into town while riding my bicycle. You ever tried that? Let me tell you, that's quite a feat right there. He said, I would sleep with my basketball. I'd do all kinds. Of, whatever I did, wherever I went, I had the basketball with me. It just became an extension of my hand. And what he was saying is he was so daily focused on becoming better with his basketball skills as a child or, or as a teen that when he became an adult, he was better at it than anybody else. Now listen, if you will focus daily on praying, if you'll focus daily on reading God's Word, if you'll focus daily on worshiping the Lord and fellowship with other Christians, you'll find yourself deepening your relationship with Jesus and developing your faith into a strong faith. We also work on our salvation as we focus on obeying God. Paul says, verse 12, work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. Now, I'm going to focus on that in just a moment, but, but more, but let me tell you, you can be faithfully participating in activities in the Christian life, but not developing your salvation if you're not committed to obeying God. Everybody say obeying God. Obey God. It's one thing to learn about it. It's one thing to practice. It's another thing to obey God with it. Heard about a man who fell over a cliff one time, and he was just hanging uh, for his dear life to a little shrub tree. And he looked down, and he saw the, the gorge below. That, that was certainly death if he fell into it. And so all of a sudden, all of a sudden, he became a believer in God. How many of you know people, atheists, turn into believers when they're in a crisis, right? And so he cried out to the heavens. He said, is there anybody up there who can help me? And a booming voice came from heaven and said, yes, I'm God, and I can help you. And the man said, well, what do you want me to do? And the booming voice said, just let go of the tree, and I will catch you. The man thought for a moment and asked, is there anybody else up there who can help me? Sometimes we're like that guy. We hear from the Lord. As we read God's Word, as we hear the pastor, as we talk with another Christian, we hear God's Word, but we're not... We're not willing to do what he's called us. Then let me tell you, that, that will keep you from living a victorious life and, and getting all that you need to get out of your salvation. We also work on our salvation as we focus on depending on God. Uh, Paul writes in verse 13, for God is working in you. And those words remind us that the Christian life is not a self-help, do-it-yourself, independent effort. In fact, that word working in the Greek language is the word we get the word energy from. It reminds us that we can live the Christian life not because of our ability or, or our energy, but because of God's energy in our lives that comes from the Holy Spirit in our lives. And let me tell you, we need the Holy Spirit's help. Tell the person beside you, I need the Holy Spirit's help. Go and tell them. We all need the Holy Spirit's help. And the same Holy Spirit that directed and empowered Jesus is available to guide us, empower us, help us in our day and time. And then we work on our salvation as we focus on pleasing God. Paul says in verse 13, for God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases. How many of you know that when you are walking in God's will, you're pleasing him? That's the best kind of life right there. The best kind of life. So, to live a different kind of life. We've got to work on our salvation. We've got to do that by getting closer to the Lord, obeying the Lord, depending on God's Spirit, and pleasing the Lord with our attitude, actions, ambitions, and relationships. But also to live a different kind of life, we must shine out as lights in a darkened world. Look at verses 14 and 15. Paul says, do everything without complaining and arguing. So that no one can criticize you. Live a clean, innocent life. Live as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked 
and perverse people. Now, the word lights means luminaries. It refers to the heavenly bodies, the sun, the moon, and the stars that stand out in stark contrast to the heavens as we view, with, view them with our own eyes. We're told in Genesis 1 that God created our world. He made the sun to rule over the earth by day. He made the moon to rule over the earth by night, and he made the stars as well. And right after that, he tells us that these heavenly bodies were intended to give light to the earth. What a picture that is of God's purpose for Christians. We are we're to be the stars, not, not celebrity kind of stars, but the real stars. We're to be like the real stars, bringing light to a darkened world. And how many of you know our world is a dark world that needs a lot of light? The world's in darkness intellectually. People don't know where they came from, where they're going, or why they're here. The world's in darkness morally. The world doesn't have a clue about the great moral issues of our day. The, the world's in darkness spiritually. It has no clue about God, how to get to God, and, 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 about, and how, to get, how to get to heaven. I'm telling you, the world is in darkness, and, and the, but the Lord wants us to be lights in the midst of that darkness. So how can we be bright lights in a dark world? Well, underline this statement. To be lights in a darkened world, we have to focus on living right. Living right. Now, when we think about living right, we think about staying away from the so-called major sins of life. The seven sins, the major sins were first enumerated by Pope Gregory in the 6th century. Uh, the, the seven deadly sins are pride, greed, lust, envy, gluttony, which includes drunkenness or getting high, wrath, and sloth or laziness. And, and by the way, each of those seven major sins can be overcome by humility, charity, chastity, gratitude, temperance, patience, and diligence. Now, we understand those seven major sins. <coughs> and how many of you understand they're not good for you in your life, right? They drag you down, take you down. But when Paul writes about two other sins, we don't often proceed to be sins. He says, do everything without complaining and arguing ask you, do you know anybody who is a complainer? They complain about the weather. They complain about their work. They complain about the people they're working with. They complain about the traffic. They complain about the world. Anybody, how many of you know people like that? Come on, be honest. Let me ask you, are you ever like that? Are you ever like that? And do you know, how many of you know people who are arguers? They like to argue. They love to argue about anything and everything. Are you one of those types of individuals? Paul says that we're to live our lives without complaining and arguing so we can shine brightly in the world around us. And the Bible tells us, by the way, in 1 Corinthians 10, that God ranks complaining along with fornication, adultery, and stuff. I mean, it's a serious sin in the eyes of the Lord. And arguing, people argue about politics and lifestyles and priorities and what pleasures are good and ungodly, all kinds of things. But let me tell you something. We need, to, we need to understand people can have different opinions, but we need to express our differences without arguing. Can I get an amen right there? Can I get a better amen right there? Sometimes we just have to say you can be wrong if you want to. Do everything without complaining and arguing. And then Paul writes, live clean, innocent lives as children of God. And that verse tells us that we're to live godly and blameless lives. How, how would you describe a godly and blameless life? As somebody who lives a God, would you say they're truthful, they're honest, they're genuine, they're caring, they're compassionate, they stay away from those big, big sins. Life. I don't know how you would describe somebody who lives a clean and innocent life. But let me tell you, here's what I know we all ought to be that person. Amen? To be lights in a darkened world, the Bible says in Ephesians 5, once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord, so live as people of light, for this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. To be lights in a darkened world, we have to focus on living right, but we also have to focus on shining bright. Underline that statement. We have to focus on shining bright. Paul says, live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. Now, Paul says 2,000 years ago, our world is full of crooked and perverse people. I wonder what he would say today. I wonder what he would say today. Scientifically and educationally, our world is a better world to live in. But morally and spiritually, it may be a worse world to live in. Think about this. Science has enabled us to walk safely on the moon, and we still can't walk safely on our streets. Education has increased our knowledge exponentially, but... Higher education hasn't changed the lower nature of many human beings. 
We live in a world today that's characterized by anger, crime, depravity, hatred, immorality, injustice, self-centeredness, and lots of other terrible things. But notice where the light is to be shining. And the light's to be shining where? Right in the middle of the darkness. Now, some Christians want to retreat from the world. They'll get to come to life group and say, man, I'm so glad to be in a life group tonight where people love Jesus. I can't stand being around the people in the world. Oftentimes, Christians want to retreat from the world. We want to isolate ourselves from the ways and people of the world, but, but light is intended for darkness. Have you ever seen a lighthouse? It's built to shine brightly in the light, in the dark. Anybody ever had a night light in your home? A night light? It's our design to shine brightly in the darkness so human beings can make their way safely to the restroom in the middle of the night. It's the purpose of a lighthouse or a nightlight or a Christian to shine bright in dark places. Now, some of you think of a pastor. I'm in an office where everyone else is lost. It's such a dark place. Only time I ever hear God's name mentioned when somebody's cussing. And you wouldn't believe the awful conversations and the flirtation they play. There's the greed, the throat cutting, the materialism, the God. How many of you know what I'm talking about right there? Oh, pastor, I wish God would take me out of this place so I could work in a much better place. Maybe God put you there in the first place. Maybe he put you there so you could be a light in that place of darkness. Do you remember the story of Daniel in the Old Testament? Daniel was a great man of God. Daniel was a mighty man of God. He came as a captive from uh, Israel to uh, Babylon, but he became a leading government official in Babylon and then in Persia. How did, how did Daniel get there? He was captured by the Babylonians, but God says in Jeremiah 29, 4, I'm the one who brought the people to Babylon. I'm the one who set that up. Why did God do that? One, to punish the people of Israel because they had fallen back into sin. But another reason is because he wanted there to be some light in the dark place of Babylon. Now listen, uh, we may cry out, God, I want to get out of Babylon. I want to get away from this job or this community or these people. Listen, God's plan is not for you to escape from the world. His plan for you is to confront the world, overcome the world, and be a consistent and bright light to the people of the world. And remember what happened to Daniel? He was such a bright light in the kingdom of Persia that other people got jealous of him. They saw God's favor on him. They set him up. And as a result, yeah, I don't have time to read the stories. And Daniel's sick. They set him up. As a result, Daniel wound up in a den of hungry lions. Remember that story? Now, he wasn't afraid. Daniel just put up one, pulled up one line on one side, another line on the other side, took out his Old Testament and began to read between the lines. The next day, the king came looking for Daniel because the king was concerned about Daniel. And he said, Daniel, are you okay? Daniel, who serves God, are you okay? And Daniel said, Man, king, I'm doing just fine right down here. And the Bible says the king had Daniel pulled out of that pit of, uh, of hungry lion. And then the king made a decree that all the people in the nation would have to worship the God of Daniel, the God who delivers, the God who provides, the God who protects, the God who helps, the God who blesses. Because Daniel was willing to be a bright light in a dark world. Let me tell you, the Lord wants you to have a similar impact on the people around you in our dark world. Light. Darkness is overcome when light is shared. And direction is offered when light is shared. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 16, Let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. So how do you know if you've been a shining light in our world? Here's the test. People will see us doing good deeds for the Lord and for others. And as a result, they will want to know more about our God and the salvation and transformation he brings to human beings. Listen, when you begin to live your life in such a way that people are attracted to Jesus Christ and want to glorify our Heavenly Father, you will know that your light is shining bright. We ought to live our lives in such a way that people look at us. And they're drawn to us. They want to know what makes us tick. What makes us act like we act? What makes us do the things we do? What makes us love like we love? And light exposes the darkness, and light drives away the dark, but light also attracts people to the Lord, to you and me and to our church. And your purpose as a Christian, one of your purpose is to be a light in a dark world. 
The little boy was taken by his mother to a famous cathedral. He watched the sunbeams shining through the stained glass windows. So he asked, who are those people on the windows? And his mother said, they're the saints. And the boy said, now I know what the saints are. They're people who let the light shine through them. Here's the third thing, to live differently, a different kind of life. We must hold firmly to the word of life. Paul says in verse 16, hold firmly. Everybody say hold. Hold firmly to the word of life. Now, what's the word of life? When we see references to the word in Scripture, we typically think of the Bible, which we call the word of God. But when Paul wrote these words, uh, there wasn't a Bible, a New Testament Bible for Christians to study. In fact, the, the Bible didn't come along, complete Bible, until the third century. So this is not a reference to the Bible. It's a, the word of God. It's a reference to Jesus, the word of life. The Bible says in John 1, in the beginning, the word already existed. He was with God, and the word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. The Word gave life. Everybody say life. The Word gave life to everything that was created, and brought, his life brought light to everyone. In John 11, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the, I'm the life. He said in John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the, he's the Word of life, who brings abundant life to our lives and eternal life to our lives when we're trusting in him and close to him. Now, how do we hold firmly to Jesus? First of all, we have to daily connect with him. Underline that phrase. we got to daily connect with him. I'm talking about spending time with Jesus, daily connecting with him. You see, we need to experience the Lord's presence for our lives, not just on Sundays, but also on Mondays through Saturdays as well. Amen? Can I get a better amen right there? But we're not going to daily experience the Lord's comfort and the Lord's direction and help and insight and strength if we're not daily interacting with him, daily spending time with him. How do we do that? We do that by worshiping him every day. Everybody say every day. Every day we need to be worshiping the Lord in some kind of way. It may be reading a psalm. It may be listening to Christian music. It, it may be watching a Christian. We need to be worshiping. We need to be praying to the Lord every day. Everybody say every day. Every day. I mean, when you get up and eat your breakfast in the morning. You ought to pray to the Lord and give thanks for that food. And maybe he might even remove some calories from that food while you're eating it. <laughs> when you're taking your shower, you can spend that time praying to the Lord. You say, in the shower, Pastor, God already knows what you look like. When you're driving to work, you ought to be praying. If you drive in New Orleans, you ought to be praying all the time <laughs> while you're driving to work. When you get to work, you can spend time praying. I, I heard of a businessman who, when he got to his high-rise building, he would not take the elevator to his office. He would walk up the steps uh, all the way to his office. He called them his prayer steps. All the way up, he was praying to the Lord, asking for direction from the Lord, asking for help from the Lord. At the end of the day, he would walk back down the steps, thanking God for all the help and direction he had received. Here's what I'm telling you. Every day, you and I need to connect to the Lord through worship and prayer and Bible reading, if we're going to live strong, victorious, and vibrant lives. Jesus said, remain in me and I'll remain in you, for a branch cannot bear, produce fruit if it's severed from the vine. You can't be fruitful. You can't have the life and the victorious life you want to have unless you stay connected to Jesus. And then to hold firmly to Jesus, we have to daily submit to him. Jesus said in John 15, 10, when you obey, everybody say obey, my commandments. You remain in my love, as I obey my, just as I obey my Father's commandments, remain in his love. We obey the Lord by prioritizing him, by loving others, by serving others, and by living for him rather than for the world or for ourselves. Now, tomorrow is the day for the big eclipse. How many of you heard about that? All right. Millions of people across our nation, they've already flown to places across our nation where they can be right there where the eclipse takes place. Lots of people will drive to cities and states so they can better see the eclipse. And some people will project that the eclipse is a sign that the end of time is near. Although there's no biblical reference they can point to. Supposedly, the eclipse is the pass over all the towns in the United States named Nineveh. But all you have to do is look at a map to say, see, it's not going to do that. In fact, one of them that Nineveh's mentioned is in Virginia, and the eclipse isn't even going anywhere near Virginia. So don't fall for that kind of sensationalism. Listen, seeking signs in an eclipse isn't Christian. It's astrology. And the Bible says we're not to have anything to do with astrology. You want to know the future? Read your Bible. 
Or listen to a sermon series I did on Wednesday nights recently titled, Get Ready, Jesus is Coming. Now, I remember the last time we had a big eclipse. It was in 2017. Anybody remember 2017? And so, uh, like most, a lot of people, I, I didn't even think about getting solar eclipse glasses. So I had some of my own made. I think they have a picture of uh, uh, me. I made my own eclipses right there. I'm just kidding. That's not me. Those wouldn't work anyhow. Don't try those, all right? But uh, I was hunting for eclipse glasses just for a sermon illustration, and I couldn't find any. They are already out. So somebody at church loaned me some eclipse glasses. And how many of you have your eclipse glasses? Let me see your hand. So I can't see anything right now. Eclipse glasses. Now, that we are told that you need to wear eclipse glasses if you're going to look directly at the sun when the eclipse has taken place. 2017, you were told, don't look directly at the sun without special eclipse glasses. But, but how many of you did? Come on, tell the truth right now. Some of you are lying right now. You didn't buy eclipse glasses. But you looked up at the sun. It got darker. Oh, yeah. Thank God you're still here. Amen? Thank God. You're still... Why didn't you do what the authorities tell you to do? Because inside of us, there's that natural tendency to rebel, to disobey. But let me tell you, rebellion and disobedience leads to disaster in someone's life. If you want to hold on to the word of life, if you want to experience the best kind of life, you've got to connect daily with Jesus and submit daily to Jesus and his way and will for your life. But here's what you'll discover. Jesus' way is always the best way. Amen? Always the best way. Our pastors and leaders who are here are coming to join me at the front. They're coming to pray with people, and they're coming to pray for people. At the end of our passage, Paul says to the Christians in Philippi, I want you to experience great, great joy. Joy is a great quality to have. Pastor Patrick preached about it back in January. How many of you know it's a lot better to live with joy than it is to live without joy, right? Several years ago, there was a survey across our nation. Here's what it discovered. Listen carefully. It discovered only 6 to 10% of, of, of Americans are real, devoted Christians. Think about that. Only 6 to 10% of Americans are real, devoted Christians who are working hard on their salvation, who are shining out like bright lights in a dark world, who are holding firmly to the Word of life. Only 6 to 10% of America's population are real, devoted Christians. But here's what the survey also discovered. Those Christians have healthier marriages and healthier families. Those, those Christians are far more generous than the rest of the population. And those Christians have much more joy than the rest of the population. I'm telling you, when we are working hard on our salvation, when we're shining brightly in a dark world, when we're holding firmly to the word of life, man, what a difference it makes in our lives. We can live with joy and peace and victory every day of our lives. Amen? Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed and people are coming for prayer. If you have a need in your life, we want to pray with you and we want to pray for you. If I let me just ask you right now with our heads bowed, how many of you got a need in your life? Come on, lift up your hands. How many of you know somebody near to you that has a need in their life, a great need in their life, a great struggle, a great need. Just get out of your seat and come quickly. We want to pray with you. We want to pray for you. Don't wait. Don't look around. The Lord will meet you here when you come forward. He will meet you here. He will hear your prayer. He will begin to work in response to your prayer. He'll work miracles in your life and other people's lives, but you've got to come and ask the Lord for his help. I want you to come. Some of you need to come. Because you haven't been working hard on your salvation. You've been blending in with the world rather than shining brightly in a dark world. You haven't been holding firmly to the word of life, who is Jesus. And today, God's calling you to rise up, to live differently. So you can really make life count in the days ahead. You come.
as Dwight sings this song. You come. I've been changed, healed, free, delivered. I found joy, peace, and grace, and favor. Been changed, healed, freed, delivered. I found joy, peace, and grace. Our heads are bowed, and eyes are closed. All that we really need in life is found in the person and power of Jesus Christ. But every day, we got to try to connect with him and submit to him. Every day, we got to be committed to shining bright as a light in a darkened world. Every day, we got to be working hard on our salvation. But as we do, we'll experience the joy and the peace and the favor and the blessing of the Lord in our lives, our circumstances, and our relationships. But first of all, you got to have Jesus in your life. You don't get Jesus in your life, again, until you recognize your need for him. You repent of your sin. You put your faith and trust in him. You surrender your life to him. And today, if you need to do that for the first time, or you need to rededicate your life to the Lord, I want you to pray with me right now. You say, Pastor, what do I pray? Just pray these words and really mean them. Pray, dear Lord Jesus, dear Lord Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you're the Savior of the world. Today, I'm asking you to come into my life, to forgive me of my sins, and begin the process of transforming my life. Take away my shame, my guilt, my hurt, and my pain. Fill my life with your presence, your peace, your love, your joy, and the power to change. I want you, Jesus, to become the Savior and the Lord of my life. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Now, listen, would you hold up this communication card? Everybody hold up this communication card. Hold up this communication card. If you haven't already filled it out, take a moment to fill it out. On the back, there's a place you can list any prayer requests that you have for yourself or for others. But there's also a place on the back that says, My Decision. If today you pray for me to receive Jesus as your Savior, or you need you dedicated your life to the Lord, or there's some other decision like baptism that you need to make. Would you take a moment and fill that out? For example, next Sunday... Next Sunday, we're going to be having a First Steps class where we're going to be sharing with you what it means to be a celebration member. I think it starts at like 10, 15, right after this service. But if you would register for that, uh, we look forward to seeing you for that class and seeing what God's going to do in your life in the coming days. Take a moment and fill that out. The wife's going to sing, and I'm going to pray for you before we dismiss. I've been changed. I'm going to sing that song with Dwight. If you've been changed, say, I've been changed. I've been changed. I've been changed. Yeah. He. I mean, you've been healed. Let me see your hand. And free. Come on. And deliver. Deliver. I found joy. I found joy and peace and grace. Let me just pray. And faith. Pastor Darius comes. Lord, in the name of Jesus, all those things we've just sung are available to those who are working hard on their salvation, who are committed to shining brightly in the dark world around them who are holding firmly to the word of life, who is Jesus. Lord, your way is so much better than our way. Anybody else's way, the world's way, your way is so much better. Help us to embrace that and pursue that so we can today in the coming days really learn how to make life 
account how to experience a life filled with meaning, the very best life has to offer. For all that you have done, all that you are doing, all that you will do, we'll give you glory and honor and praise. Come on, clap your hands and thank God for his word today.